So let me express my gratitude to Professor Ho uh, from uh, the Middle East Institute and uh, Professor Sakai from Chiba University, uh, who gave me an opportunity to join this panel. My name is Masaki Matsuo from Tsunomiya University, Japan. My major is the political economy of the Middle East, and especially about authoritarian survival through distribution of petroleum wealth. And also, I am one of members of a research team that is studying about the international migration from Asia to the Arab Gulf states. Uh, so this presentation is a part of our research activities. About our activities, uh, please check Neo Plural Society on Google. So you can find our uh, site, our website. <coughs> So this presentation is a joint presentation. Uh, at first, I will explain the outline of the concept of neo-plural society. Then Professor Ishii uh, will uh, talk about uh, the Filipino migra domestic migrant workers in the Arab Gulf states. The Arab Gulf states consists of six countries of Kuwait, Qatar, and uh, Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Oman, and Saudi Arabia. Here after AGS, is famous for its economic prosperity based on the uh, export of petrol, uh, petrol. And the rapid economic growth has attracted a huge number of migrant workers from all over the world. This created a very unique society that is the neo-plural society. So, uh, <coughs> As you know, the concept of a plural society was coined in early 20th century by uh, J sorry, yes, <laughs> uh, by J. S. Farnival, a British colonial officer, to describe uh, the societies in the Southeast Asia. <clears throat> the concept of a neo-plural society is based on it, but uh, at the same time, it is new concept. Neo-plural society here of the NPS is a society built by the combination of three elements, uh, the international migration and the non-integration immigration policy and the choice of uh, migrants. <coughs> Plurality here means the existence of independent groups in single society. The border between groups coincides roughly with their nationalities. The term independent here means that each group is socially closed. Hence, building reciprocal relations between different groups is uncommon. In addition, there is a hierarchic structure between citizens and migrants. We consider that the AGS is a typical of the NPS. Uh, please look at the uh, table one. This shows the numbers and the percentage of uh, international migrants by regions. Today, Asia is the main region of international migration. 43%, uh, 104 million of migrants came from Asia, and 33%, 75 million uh, moved toward Asia, both as an origin and as a destination. Uh, Asia is the largest region of the international migration. And the main destination in Asia is the Arab Gulf states. That absorbs about 34% of migrants in Asia. We can confirm that the AGS has the centrality in international migration in Asia, and hence, it should be considered one of centers of the global migration. The AGS basically implements so-called demand-driven immigration policy. It is the system uh, that employers apply for visas for migrants in coordination with recruitment agencies, which supply international migrant workers. Uh, this system gives employers upper hand over employees because employers have to obedient for fear that employer, uh, employers will cancel the work contract. When they lose jobs, migrant workers have to leave the country. This creates asymmetrical power structures between employers and employees. And this asymmetrical power structure is reflected to the relation between citizens and uh, migrants in the AGS. 
And migrant society in AGS have diversity in terms of their nationality. Uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia in 2015, 27% 27 of migrants come from India, uh, followed by uh, Indonesia, 18%, and Pakistan, uh, uh, 60%, and Bangladesh, 14%. Arab migrants consist of only 18% in total migrants population. The non-integration immigration policy is a characteristic too. In AGS, according to the survey of the United Nations, no immigrant integration policy is implemented. Naturalization is practically prohibited and dual citizenship is denied. Despite the entire economic reliance to immigrants, governments of the AGS do not have any intention to integrate them into the, their host society. This policy retains asymmetric power structures between citizens and migrants. Social and economic gaps between them become wider and wider. There is no reciprocal relation between citizens and migrants. So, this is exactly the plural society of J.S. Farnival, who described the society of Southeast Asia as follows. Probably the first thing uh, uh, that uh, strikes the visitor, uh, visitor here, mean the visitor to the Southeast Asia, is the medley of peoples, European, Chinese, Indian, and a native. It is in the strictest sense a medley, for they mix but do not combine. Each group holds by its own religion, its own culture and the language, its own ideas and ways. As individuals, they meet, but only in the marketplace in buying and selling. There's a plural society with different sections of community living side by side, but separately within the same political unit. Even in the economic sphere, there is a division of labor along racial lines. After Farnival, many scholars have described societies in various parts of the world, such as Caribbean uh, countries and uh, Africa, as plural societies. Also, a model of democracy in multi-ethnic uh, countries was built on this concept. In doing so, some scholars considered plurality as a difficulty to build a unity of a modern nation. On the other hand, other scholars consider it as a prerequisite to uh, allocate ethnic minority groups political power to allow them to take part in decision-making process of national politics. In short, this concept was applied to study issues around the equality or inequality of rights between groups. However, all of these discussions are limited to a frame of modern nation. But today, we can find a lot of societies that include non-nationals, I mean migrants. Sometimes migrants are excluded from the target to be integrated to, uh, uh, as a part of one society. This implies that the international migration may bring a new kind of plurality that is created by the gap between citizens and the migrants. This is the neo-plural society. As I mentioned earlier, the AGS implemented non-integration immigration policy. This policy is criticized as a kind of xenophobia. However, now many countries are implementing so-called selective immigration policy that creates nearly the same migrant condition to the AGS. Under selective immigration policies, migrants who are categorized to low-skilled workers can stay there only two or three years and they are excluded from the target of social integration. Also, the implementation of a demand-driven uh, immigration system becomes prevalent globally. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the same system that the AGS is now implementing. These indicate that the neo-plural society is not unique to the AGS, but it has some kind of universality. The NPS has two effects toward migrants. First, 
LPS increases the deportability and the vulnerability of migrants. Because employers always have upper hand on work contracts, migrant workers cannot determine how long they can stay there. Under such circumstances, migrants tend to build social relations with migrants of the same nationality because it may work after their sudden return. In other words, they become to have offshore affinity. This makes migrants create closed communities. Here, we perceive that migrants themselves reproduce the neo-plural society. Second, on the other hand, migrants do not need to pay the cost of adaptation to host societies. In the AGS, they can have uh, opportunities to work without learning Arabic nor getting accustomed to so-called Islamic way of life. This is also the reason why migrants tend to choose to move to the NPS. This keeps the movement of migrants toward the NPS and then maintains neo-plural societies. This is the outline of the concept of NPS. Now I'd like to change to Professor Ishii. So thank you so much for your kind attention. So good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you very much for giving us this uh, great opportunity to share our research. As Professor Matsu has just explained, how the uh, neo-plural society has emerged in the Arab Gulf states, on my part, I would like to examine the empowerment of the domestic workers, in the, uh, especially in the UAE, uh, who are working at the bottom layer of these hierarchical neo-plural societies especially focusing a case of the Muslim Filipina domestic workers. Uh, this, uh, sorry. Uh, this is to just give you an overview of the overseas Filipino workers in the Arab Gulf states. The Philippines is one of the major labor sending countries in the world, but their major destinations are the Arab Gulf states. Around 900,000 overseas Filipino workers are in the Arab Gulf states, and there are around 227,000 Filipinos in the UAE in year 2015. And the uh, Muslims in the Philippines constitute the largest minority groups comprising 5 to 6 percent of the total population, which is approximately 5 to 6 million. The Muslim populated area in the Christian dominated Philippines is one of the most impoverished regions today. This is due to the armed conflict that has been mainly fought between the uh, Muslim separatist groups and then the armed forces of the Philippines. In Sarangani region, where I have been conducting the field work since 1995, there is a discrimination against the minority Muslims, and few employment opportunities are available for them in the local labor market. It is in this situation that the way to becoming a domestic work worker in the Middle East is open. And, but it is difficult to, to know how many Muslim Filipinas are working in the UAE as domestic, worker, uh, as, as domestic workers because the statistics does not mention about the religious affiliation. In 2010, according to the statistics of the Philippine Authority, there were around uh, 13,000 Filipina domestic workers in the UAE. My presentation examines the empowerment of the Muslim Filipina domestic workers in the UAE by referring to the analytical framework of the Naira Kabir's works. Kabir's definition of the empowerment takes choice as its central concept. According to Kabir, empowerment refers to the process by which those who have been denied the capacity for choice gain this capacity. In order to examine the empowerment of the Muslim domestic uh, workers, uh, uh, Muslim Filipina domestic workers, I'd like to refer to the three distinctions she made related to the uh, consequences of choices. The first is the trivial choices we make on an everyday basis. The second is significant choices or the most strategic life choices that have profound consequences for the quality and direction of the lives. And the third is the choices to negotiate with a broader structure of inequality. In the uh, UAE, there are uh, 
asymmetrical power relations and insurmountable class differences between the employers and migrant domestic workers. Therefore, as uh, 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 Lava has also pointed out, the international human rights organizations criticize the injustice caused by the asymmetrical power relationship, and their criticism is very important, as I will discuss it later. However, it is also important to examine how their empowerment can be constrained or attained by experiencing of being powerlessness by focusing on to what extent their choices are enlarged or not. At the same time, it is also important to understand why the feeling of inequality is difficult to be translated into the feeling of injustice. Uh, this is just a methodological note uh, for this research. I've conducted both field work and interviews in Sarangani regions in the Philippines, and I also conducted uh, interviews in the UAE. The labor migration is considered to be voluntary migration and not forced migration. The migration of Muslim Filipino domestic workers is also voluntary migration, but it is important to consider the aspect that few alternative choices other than becoming a domestic workers are available for them. With regard to assessing the women's empowerment by participating into the labor market, Kabir argues that it is important to situate the women's agency in the forces of inclusion and exclusion in the labor market. Most of the Muslim Filipino domestic workers I met before 2015 were lowly paid around 200 US dollars per month with no day off and during long hours of work and their movement and communication had been restricted. The initial placement fee in cash for a domestic worker in the Middle East ranged from 100 to 300 US dollars. In total, they were charged around two to four months salary as placement fee, which they were supposed to pay back once they began working. In this presentation, I refer to this type of Muslim Filipina domestic worker as type A, MFDW. Uh, on the other hand, it was since 2015 that I've come to meet the Muslim Filipina domestic workers who had the first, the regular income of decent amount for her living standard in Sarangani region, the second, securing private space outside workplace where she can enjoy new social relationships and gain new experiences in her day offs, the third, and safe uh, working environment. According to Kabir, these are the important elements which contribute to empowerment, empowering women. I refer to the Muslim Filipina domestic workers who work with these three conditions as type B, uh, MFDW. As Professor Matsu has explained, with the influx of the migrants, the Arab Gulf states have become a typology of plural society. For the migrant domestic workers, nationality, class, and religion divide, segregate them apart from the rest in terms of social interactions. Uh, on the other hand, the pluralistic form of the society would provide with them some choices for their empowerment if she is a type B MFDW. For example, because labor market is segregated by nationality, there exists loosely formed Filipino community, which also functions as an informal safety nets for the fellow troubled Filipinos in the UAE. Among the low-skilled uh, migrant workers, there are developed informal uh, care or safety nets uh, to help the troubled workers who cannot avail of official assistance. By gaining experiences in the Arab Gulf states, Migrant workers gradually come to understand the existence and function of the informal uh, safety nets. In other words, they would gradually acquire survival strategies by experiences. On the other hand, the treatment as a second class Muslims provide with them an observer status to evaluate both host society as well as their own society. Uh, they gain a critical stance toward the Arab patriarchal society they can gain a critical stance toward Muslims at the center, and they can also gain a critical stance toward the Christian-dominated uh, Philippine society. Neo-plural society in the UAE is hierarchically organized. 
In other words, the relationship between the national and non-nationals, as well as among the nationals, different nationals are unequally organized. However, because of this citizenship and nationality divide, inequality is taken for granted, and the feeling of inequality is difficult to be translated into the feeling of injustice. Because the social activism is restricted, there are a few mediators to voice out the actual injustices committed against the vulnerable migrants. Their sense of belonging is uh, offshored, as Professor Matsu explained, as well as the feeling of injustice. In this regard, the role of human rights organizations is important to raise the voice of the voiceless and advocate to change the structure of inequality which keep of on marginalizing the vulnerable migrant uh, workers. Uh, so the uh, conclusion, in order to understand the empowerment of those who are placed in the powerlessness situation, it is important to examine to what extent choices are enlarged from the perspective of the agency. With regard to the type B Muslim Filipino domestic workers, their trivial choices and significant choices are enlarged. It is important to implement the policies to ensure their regular income, their private space or social interactions, and their safe working conditions. However, their enlarged choices are yet to be negotiated with a broader structure of inequality, which continuously deprives them of alternative choices other than becoming an overseas domestic workers. Thank you very much. <laughs>